Hi, I'm Father Chris Aylar of the Marians of the Immaculate Conception here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy, and welcome to Living Divine Mercy here on the EWTN Television Network, the show that brings you teaching about God's mercy as well as stories of people living it in their lives. You know, this Sunday at Mass, we will read about the wedding feast at Cana, and this account in the Gospel of John is so important, yet so misunderstood that we decided to do a program on it. Now, we all know that love is the most important of all virtues, and that love is about giving and receiving. We give of ourselves, we become empty, and then we have room to receive. That is why the most important thing at our personal judgment will be how much did we love. We must be empty through the giving of our own love so that we can then receive all the love and grace God wants to give to us. You see, if we are filled with the junk of the world and the riches of the world, even God can fill us with the riches of the world to come and becoming empty so that we can then be filled is what the wedding feast of Cana is all about. You know, Mary does not expose the couple to shame or make public their empty jars with a lack of wine. Rather, Mary brings our lack, our emptiness, or our misery to Jesus in the same way, quietly. She doesn't make a big deal about it like we would at a wedding. Can you believe the groom and the bride let this happen? No, that's kind of like Satan. When he would point out our misery, he would say it to, to cause us to despair, not to bring us to Jesus like Mary. He would point to our lack or our misery and say, give up. You have no good in you. Don't fall for this lie and his traps, right? Because Jesus, on the other hand, desires to fill our emptiness with good. So sometimes it's okay that we're empty or we feel empty because then God can fill us with his divine wine, which is the Holy Spirit. So, as we said, the empty jars are like our misery and our lack, waiting to be filled to the very brim with God's divine mercy. But to get this grace— and his mercy. We need a vessel to receive it, to catch it. And that vessel, St. Faustina tells us, is trust. You know, you want to get to heaven. I want to get to heaven. We wouldn't be here if we didn't. But in order to get to heaven, we need grace. The Bible tells us this. And Jesus told St. Faustina that trust is the vessel by which all grace is received. That is what Cana is all about, a sign that our emptiness will always be filled as long as we have faith and trust. And Mary helps us to do that. At Cana, she was an advocate for us, asking Jesus to fill what is empty. You know, Jesus wasn't going to act, but then Mary interceded. Then Jesus acted. So right here, we see a biblical account of Mary's intercession. But what about this apparent, impersonal way Jesus addressed her, saying, Woman, what does this have to do with me? Well, the term woman was actually endearing to the time. It is a reversal of Genesis 3, when Eve prompted Adam to defy the Lord and fall into sin. But at Cana, Mary, the new Eve, prompts Jesus, the new Adam, to begin the mission of salvation to undo this disobedience with obedience. And she could do this because she was herself first obedient, saying, do whatever he tells you. These are Mary's final words in the New Testament. And then it says the apostles came to believe in him. So it really was Mary who launched the apostles' ship of faith. 
And you know, in addition, with these words, Mary echoes Israel's profession of faith at Mount Sinai when they said, we'll do whatever God tells us. Well, we know that they didn't and they failed, but so do we. And the story, though, is the message for today. The Old Testament has a message for us. It was about God being the faithful husband and Israel being the unfaithful bride. Sound familiar? Yeah. Now, Jesus is identified in the Gospel of John as the messianic bridegroom. And like any good Catholic wedding, the groom provides the wine for a marriage feast. I remember my mom and dad talking when they got married. My dad's family bought the wine. The groom did. And now here as the bride, we see the church and Mary representing Israel, being obedient like they said that they would be in the Old Testament when she said, do whatever he tells you. You know, Mary's words represent us reflecting the heart of a bride in love with her bridegroom. Representing the faithful of Israel, Mary invites the servants, the disciples, to do God's will, whatever he says. You know, John Paul II said that there were two miracles before the main Passover miracle of the Last Supper. First, Jesus supplied the wine at the wedding of Cana. And second, he supplied the bread on the mountain at the multiplication of the loaves. So you see here, bread and wine, it's coming up. Only then he would turn this bread and wine into his body and blood at the Last Supper. Wow. The good wine that Mary leads the servants to at Cana is itself a foreshadowing of the Eucharistic wine. Why? Because in biblical times, wine was not merely a good drink, but rather a sign of abundance, life, and joy. You know, bread and water were just the minimum necessary for life. They were the staples of survival. Wine, on the other hand, was gratuitous, indicating that life was more than just survival, but was abundance. Now, Mary's pronouncement that they have no wine is therefore not merely an expression of her concern that the couple, as we said, would be publicly shamed uh, for running out of wine. No, they weren't like us sitting there, oh, I can't believe this happened. No, Mary is pointing out that without God, and especially without the Eucharist, we lack wine, the abundant life and joy that flow from being united to God. Without it, we are lacking. Now, Jesus comes as the Messiah and shows himself in this first miracle in the way that he will provide for us abundantly. In the first century, Jews were longing for their Messiah to come and for the divine bridegroom to heal and restore them, to fill their lack, as it says in Hosea in the Old Testament. That Jesus chose to have his first miracle provide an abundance of wine at a wedding is definitely intentional. It signals that the messianic bridegroom has finally arrived to usher in the great wedding feast which we will be part of at the Mass, and reunite himself to his bride, the fallen people of Israel. Thus, Jesus sanctifies the covenant of marriage at Cana. Marriage, the sacrament. You know, Cana is used to suggest the setting for Christ's nuptials, as we said a minute ago, with his church. In marriage, though, and in life, we need others often to take care of things. You know, we, the problem is, though, we often tell them how to do it. Now, Cana, however, shows us a different side. Mary didn't say how to do it. She waited with trust. That's why in life, our trust and obedience are necessary. But we all know that the wine of joy in marriage can often run dry due to many stresses and unforeseen circumstances in life. And that's why we may demand sometimes that our spouse fill these empty jars and we expect them to take care of all of our family problems, for example. 
how different this is from the way Mary presents the need for wine to Jesus. She brings the need to his attention and then waits for his help. We should do the same. That's how our prayer should be. God will provide if we patiently let him, not tell him, right? And notice how much wine was multiplied at Cana, over a hundred gallons. Now consider also the 12 baskets, the abundance of leftovers that there were after the multiplication of loaves and the fishes. So Jesus not only wants to provide for us, he wants to provide in great abundance. We must always trust in God, bringing him every empty jar, every sickness, and every pain. We can trust that in his time and in his way, he will fill us to the brim with the wine of salvation, the Holy Spirit. Wow, I didn't ever know till seminary that there was so much in the wedding feast at Cana, but praise God there is. You know, now I want to introduce you to somebody, to an incredible man that I have been so excited to get on this show. His name is Zion Clark. And this is a man of great faith that definitely, when you see him, will realize he was lacking. He was lacking in a physical way. And he, however, though, through faith and being open to receiving God's grace, has been filled to the brim with the Holy Spirit. Let us now show you and introduce you to an incredible person. This is Zion Clark. Zion, it's an honor and a pleasure to be with you. You are in demand all over the world. You're a well-known person. And for you to make the time to visit with us here today on Living Divine Mercy is an honor. Tell us a little bit about who you are and what inspired you to be so successful and what motivated you in your life to be so successful. My journey kind of starts just back in Ohio. You know, I was born in the foster care system where I experienced a lot of abuse and pain over the first 17 years of my life, not knowing who my mother is, not knowing my father, just kind of being alone, uh, going through these families that just didn't treat me very well at all. So I turned to the streets and, you know, made, found friends, you know. I uh, ended up running around, getting in trouble, and uh, just kind of started going down this downward spiral. My mom stepped up, took me in, and just completely turned my life around. You know, she's a very religious woman. She's uh, she is definitely a huge believer in Christ, and she would always pray with me. She would always speak life into me and always drop a whole bunch of knowledge bombs, wisdom bombs. In turn, like, with that, I was able to, you know, get my grades up. I started, I like, don't even know, I was still hanging out with my friends in the hood, but, man, but uh, I've, I had a vision of what I wanted to do, and I started to really work a lot harder on my wrestling and started working hard on track and field. Next thing you know, I become a two-time state champion in track and field and become one of the best wrestlers in Ohio, then go to become one of the best wrestlers in the nation through college. I'm the fastest man on their hands in the world, but at the same time, it also means that my family's winning, my town's winning, and my support group's winning because without them, I wouldn't be here doing this for you guys. I know people that have disabilities, that have disabilities the same as mine, that have disabilities that are more severe than mine, and I see them becoming high-level athletes every day. It's all about how much heart you got and how much work you're willing to put in. I, I, I'll tell that to any kid with disabilities. I'll tell that to a kid that doesn't have a disability. My message stays the same. So Zion, how do you feel the role of faith has played in your life? Especially I read about your mom, a, a real lady of faith. Tell us about your journey walking the life in Christ. Uh, my mom always said, just trust the process, trust, trust God's plan. Uh, she always tells me God wouldn't have taken me through troubled waters if I couldn't swim. And that sticks, it sticks with me all the time. And that's why every time I have a big accomplishment, I have any sort of big success, I'm always thanking the big guy upstairs first because in my book, at the end of the day, when, at, when we finally close our eyes for the last time, we're all gonna go see him, we're all gonna be judged by him. So with that, I try to live my life the best way, as good, as peaceful as I can and to instill love and joy into the world because that's how I feel that he will want us to live our lives. Zion, our show's about the mercy of God and a lot of people in your type of situation would say, where is the mercy of God? Tell us a little bit about how you have felt. Has God um, punished you, has rewarded you, has he helped you? 
How do you feel that the role of God has been in development of who you are as a person? For the things that I would experience at home and then to go to church on Sundays, what type of God would allow someone to suffer like this? And now like that I'm older, I understand it. But at the time, you know, it was very confusing to me, especially as a kid, as a young adult, because just year after year, just like think about 17 years straight, just nothing but suffering. And it's like to an extreme. And it, it makes, it, you start to doubt things. Um, you know, I'm only 24. A lot of the stuff I experienced was just barely over 10 years ago, not even a little less than 10 years ago. And um, it, it really put into perspective that you really, whether God is on your side or not, you have to, you have to work hard and he will reward your hard work. So now hearing you talk, Zion, some of the challenges that God's allowed you to have have helped develop you into the person that you are today. Um, what would you say to that? Is that an accurate statement? Without those experiences, I wouldn't have the knowledge. I wouldn't have the wisdom that I have now. And I'd probably be working some nine to five job or worse, you know, just homeless or doing something completely unproductive. Because uh, without my family, without the chances, without all the experiences, I would, I would just be a nobody. I, I don't have to talk to somebody and give a speech every single day to inspire people. If people look at what I'm doing or people see me in public just happy, living a good life, and they should be inspired by that. Because if I can be happy and be comfortable having caudal regression syndrome and no legs, you can be happy and comfortable living your own life with everything that God has blessed you with. Zion, one of the key phrases in Divine Mercy is, Jesus, I trust in you. And I've read a little bit about your story that seems like you've had a lot of trust in, in God and his guidance for you. So tell us a little about how important trust is. Uh, you know, sometimes it, you really have to take a gamble on things. Um, I had left college early. I'm gonna give you a quick little background. I left college early and, you know, I had about $50 in my pocket. No degree, nothing. But, you know, I had my Netflix thing out. I just got offered to come out to the Ellen DeGeneres show. And I, was, I went out there and I, they were, I was gonna get on a flight back to, back to Ohio after the, like the next day after the show was done. And I was like, I wonder if I could stay out here. And you know, $50 in my pocket, especially in Los Angeles, is gonna get you nowhere. Next thing you know, I'm, I'm talking to my mom and she's getting ready to go to the airport. And you know, only 50 bucks in my pocket. I said, mom, I'm not going back home. And I, she, she was like, is this what you wanna do? And I was like, I, I don't know, but I'm just gonna take a gamble and have faith that this is what I'm supposed to do out here. It's been three years since that day. And I'm set up in California. I'm, I'm running a business. I'm running a merchandise, merchandise shop. I'm just, I'm running a business as in even myself being the business. You know, I went from having $50 in my pocket and talking for free everywhere just to get my name out there, hoping that somebody would even want me booked to doing some of the biggest interviews in every country and to, starting to the point where I'm starting to go worldwide and I gotta say I gotta give all praise to the big man upstairs because without him a lot of this wouldn't be possible you know I had to put my trust and faith in him I had to really buckle down and grind hard and like I said with every victory every success I always give gave him credit and I feel like if you give God the respect and faith that is expected of you then in turn, he will open up wonders in your life. Zion, thank you so much for taking the time to meet with us. You're a busy guy, but may Almighty God bless you and your work and continue to be a great inspiration for so many other people. Thank you. Thank you, Zion. And really all we can say is, wow, what trust in God's mercy despite so many obstacles. You're an inspiration, Zion. God bless you. Now, speaking of inspirations, let me introduce you to one of our fan favorites, Cameraman Giuseppe. My name is Giuseppe Mignano, also known as Cameraman Giuseppe, as Father Chris likes to tease me with. 
I am a film editor, and I uh, edit these, uh, some of these TV shows that we're watching today. And I've uh, known the Marians for about uh, 12 years. I've worked for them now for seven years. But before I worked for them, I was actually a seminarian. When I left the Marians and I went back to the Florida and uh, I started a production company, um, and I also worked at my family's business, which uh, is a, was a garden center and a landscaping firm. Then eventually uh, a job opportunity uh, was offered here in Stockbridge and uh, I took it and I took that leap of faith and it's just been amazing. Like once the Lord opens up a door for you and it's a little nerve wracking in the beginning because taking leaps of faith are difficult because you don't know what's on the other side. Uh, but it's just been nothing but blessings and I feel blessed tremendously to be able to do what I do, to work on a TV show, you know, to, to film these um, different productions, to um, edit them, you know, and uh, it's been great. It's been a blessing since I've been here. It really has. My favorite part of this job is the people I get to work with because we have such a great team you know, from Mary Clark to Owen to Brother Mark to Dale to George to Father Chris, my boss. And the relationship I have with Father Chris is great because I was in the seminary with him. And uh, he was finishing seminary and becoming a priest when I was entering the Marians. And uh, just being, having that relationship with him and just being like two guys, just two brothers, you know, he's, he's, he's my older brother and we tease each other all the time. The best part of my job is the people I work with and the editing, because when I'm in front of the computer in the workstation and I'm editing these different episodes, it's almost like I'm playing a video game. It's like I'm, I'm in, I get into the zone and I get to do things with the footage that I'm given and I get to edit it, uh, crop it, cut it, and uh, produce something that um, was nothing, you know, and it's, it's a blessing and it's, it's actually really fun. I love what I do and I, I wouldn't change anything of it. I don't know how long it's been since I've known Divine Mercy, but St. Faustina has been a big part of my life. You know, being born on October 5th, uh, her feast day is really special. And um, just, it, I learned th about Divine Mercy through her, you know, and the diary. I would say the charism that really strikes me the most is going where the need is greatest. And I feel like that charism really struck me because it's personal. It's really like my own path of going where the Lord wants me to go, where he thinks I'm needed the most. Same thing with coming out here and, you know, coming to Stockbridge. Now look, I'm, I'm an editor on a TV show. I would never have thought that that was possible, that I would be able to accomplish that. And it's only through God that I'm able to do this. You know, he, he really guided me through this whole process, through this whole path, and uh, really is like coming here where the need was greatest. And also Jesus says in St. Faustina's diary that anybody who helps promote his divine mercy will sh be shown mercy at the end of their life. And, you know, um, I am banking on that. That's right. You better be banking on that cameraman, Giuseppe. No, it is true. We love having him part of our team. So thank you very much. Now let's go back to scripture and hear a little bit more about emptying ourselves so that we can be filled with the wine of the Holy Spirit. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with all your heart, always and for everything, giving thanks in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God the Father. St. Paul calls us to open our hearts every day to the Holy Spirit in wholehearted hymns of thanksgiving. When our hearts are wide open like this, God can pour into them the living water, his spirit of love and truth, who is the source of every grace. St. Teresa of Avila frequently meditated on our Lord's promise of living water. She writes, Oh, how often I remember the living water of which the Lord spoke to the woman of Samaria. I am so fond of that gospel. I have loved it ever since I was quite a child and I used often to beseech the Lord to give me that water. 
Filled with desire for the living water of the Holy Spirit, St. Teresa prays, O life who gives life to all, do not deny me the sweetest water that you promise to those who want it. I want it, O Lord, and I beg for it, and I come to you. Don't hide yourself, Lord, from me. Since you know my need, and that this water is the true medicine for a soul wounded with love of you. I want to blossom for my Lord and Maker, to forget about myself, to empty myself totally for the sake of immortal souls. This is my delight. My daughter, when you lower and empty yourself before my majesty, I then pursue you with my graces and make use of my omnipotence to exalt you. I accept joy or suffering, praise or humiliation with the same disposition. I remember that one and the other are passing. What does it matter to me what people say about me? I have long ago given up everything that concerns my person. My name is host or sacrifice, not in words, but in deeds, in the emptying of myself and in becoming like you on the cross, O oh, good Jesus, my master. Thank you, everybody, for joining us, and please remember to visit us at micprayers.org. There you can become a Marian helper, part of our Marian family, where you can share in so many graces of our masses, prayers, and rosaries. So please visit us. doesn't take much time and costs no money. So hope to see you there. Now, next week is a very important week because it's the March for Life, and we'll be doing a new episode about the pro-life movement and why the church teaches what she does. Until next week, may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.